Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the No Laying Up Golf Podcast. My name is Randy. I'm joined today by Cody McBride and Jordan Perez. Cody, always good to talk to you, man. How are you today? Back at it again, buddy. I'm excited here. Match play week plus Anwa, Anwa. We're going to get a lot more into that, but I'm, I'm excited, man. Well, good, good. Always happy to have you here. And also Jordan Perez. Jordan, have you made it to Augusta yet? Where are you? I have made it to Augusta. Guys, this is the best week of the year. I am so, so excited. And yeah, guys, this is where it all started. This is the first time I've potted with you guys. So I'm very happy to be yeah. here. Yeah, I know. I know. How was that drive up I-95? <laughs> mm, it's, uh, it's a little quiet. Uh, you know, get some interesting billboards spread out throughout rural Georgia. It's always my favorite. Um, had one in particular asking me if I was going to heaven or hell. I could dial like eight three something. Um, so you know, lots of roadkill, lots of uh, unsettling signs. Um, but we made it safe and sound. Perfect. Good to hear that. Uh, if you get an answer to that question, heaven or hell, please let us know. Keep us keep us up to date on that. Um, Are there any Bucky's on ninety five yet? Not the way I went. Oh, uh, well, that's yeah, a, southward. A... Yeah, southbound. That's true. I guess you could have flipped it around, but you know, I'm happy that you got there. Do you know what? My favorite thing about Bucky's though is, uh, I by far they have like the best crushed ice. You got crushed ice. Mm. You want to hold on to it for a long time. Do you know what? That's where our sponsor, the presenting sponsor of all LPGA content for us comes from. And that is our friends at Yeti. I, we love Yeti. Big thank you to them, of course, for sponsoring all of our LPGA podcasts this year. No one makes, you know, luggage, hard coolers, soft coolers, drinkware, you name it. They do it all. And, and it's truly the best. Uh, their products perform when it matters most. Everybody, please head over to Yeti.com for their complete product line and more plus they got content there they got podcasts you can check out their ambassadors everything else and a lot more yeti coming into golf both men's and women's this year i'm very very excited about that as they announced their partnership with the caddy network a couple weeks ago and uh you know they're gonna set us up get us a little bit more access to some player caddies uh we got good things coming so thanks of course to yeti biggie do, do we need to talk about phoenix again I don't think we need to talk about Phoenix. Guys, Nelly Corda can't stop winning. If if you want to hear some more thoughts from Cody and myself, check out last Sunday's recap pod. We we spend a lot of time talking about Nelly and some interesting parallels with Scotty Scheffler, yada, yada, yada. But uh, yeah, since last time we've done an LPGA specific pod, Nelly won in Palos Verdes. She clipped Ryan O'Toole in a playoff. That was an excellent event. It got extremely spicy on the weekend at Palos Verdes. The wind was up. It's already a quirky course. I, I thought it was an excellent tournament. And then fast forward to the new Ford Championship down at Seville Golf and Country Club outside of Phoenix. And Nelly wins there. She shoots a final round 65, again, in some some questionable conditions, a lot of rain. And she's showing, you know, she she's not just a, do, a dome golfer, which is awesome to see. Guys, I guess my question, Cody, I'll start with you. Given what we see now from Nelly Corda, what are your expectations? Not even expectations. What are your hopes for her this year? How How, how great of a season can she have? It's the year of Nelly. I hit big. You told me that I, I was wrong for saying that. I couldn't. I don't to think hold I actually down. said that, Cody. I don't think I actually said that. We, we one of these episodes, we're gonna have the tapes. We're gonna play the receipts. The good oh, thing I have, I, no. I have this. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it was you. It might have been TC or something. It might like have that. been our. Very, it might have been our associate Tron Carter for sure. I was very bullish because I think that she was so close last year so many times and i think the one thing that she absolutely had to get figured out and that was her putting and she seems to have completely made that change she switched putting coaches at the end of last year and it's kind of revolutionized her game it's it she's a complete product again and when nelly is healthy when she's putting well and she has the power that she has and her ball striking there's not a lot of people that can stop her i mean i think what we're seeing is it for this season as we started so far if Nelly does not win a major, it is going to be a major, major disappointment. 
but also I can foresee it, her keeping this run on and we're, we could be looking at, you know, six, seven, eight individual titles, which I think is something that is not crazy for me to say. I agree with you. I, I know. Jordan, what do you think? I mean, I do you have Nelly winning all five majors? What, talk to <laughs> me about what, what you see coming the rest of this year. Guys, I barely had Nelly winning anything but one title this year. So am I feeling extremely foolish? Sure. Um, but I'm all aboard the Nelly train now. Like, And who, who couldn't be at this point? I think if Nelly doesn't win a major, right, it certainly will be somewhat of a disappointment. I mean, she's the best player in the world right now, and it isn't even close, like, on the women's side. I mean, I, thinking about the Scotty comps and all, you know, but she's still better than Scotty, respected to being on the women's side. And so I just, look, yeah, she she, she needs to get a major this year, but it, right now, if, if the year ended right now and it ended this way, having won three times, not much you could take away from her. She's earned it. She's just done such an about face on her game. And she she escaped her putting lows. And Scotty needs to take some notes, okay? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, we talked about that in the, that last recap of, I wonder if they if they talk about things like yeah. that and, and pondering the the what coulds and could be's and maybe's and, and my, and I, I'm knowing like being a complete realist about this. I doubt that that is happening after thinking on it a little bit more, but it honestly, it should, or at least, you know, Scotty has some of the best instructors in the world, but sometimes maybe just need a different look at things. And, you know, this is a LPGA podcast, but I don't think that the, the temporary band aid of going to a mallet isn't actually like going to fix the issues in his stroke. Nelly fixed the issues in her putting stroke. She is, com and not temporarily, like obviously now this is her, her third win. This, these are things are, are stuck in motion. And I'm just really, really excited, especially because match play, I think this is a lot going three weeks on the row. And I know that she, she had that you know, seven week break, which was awesome for her. Got to spend a ton of time with family and everything, but Winning two weeks in a row, being on the road for her third week in a row into it's a demanding tournament. You know, match play is Wednesday on. They don't get that extra day of of practice or really rest for her. And she talked about yesterday in her press conference of like how, you know, how are you kind of going to relax and be able to reset in order for in order to be prepared for match play? She's like, I don't know. We have a five hour drive. I'm like, you know what? Why? Nelly, you, you have like a Delta partnership. Like, why why are you guys driving? Why are you driving and getting into to Vegas at like two, three in the morning? I understand that you got hooked up at, I'm sure, a very nice MGM bed somewhere. But today is her only day to see the course because tomorrow they're right into a pro-am. So instead of pro-ams on Wednesdays, now pro-ams on Tuesdays because they're starting play. And it's not just straight up match play big it's a new format it is a new format and i it's one that i love i i love that the lpga and shadow creek and and t-mobile and mgm and everybody associated with this tournament is willing to try new things so what the format is this year it's a 96 woman field everybody tees off wednesday uh everybody's guaranteed two rounds of stroke play they're gonna cut the field down to 36 after the second round, so after Thursday. And then the top eight after Friday are going to advance into match play this weekend. So you have to play good golf on your own ball. Uh, you know, every shot counts for three rounds. And then we get to see, you know, the, the, the best eight players this week decide who's who's the best amongst them and, and i it, it's a format that i'm very curious to see on paper i love it and i think shadow creek is such a perfect host venue for this type of format because one it, it looks spectacular on television right it's a very one of expensive golf course manicured yeah, yeah c-suite courses anywhere but that a lot of their holes uh, yeah, a lot of the holes are are risk reward. There there are some really funky greens. You know, I I think of the par three seventeenth specifically. Women have made big numbers there in the past, and that's never been an issue in match play. But 
these first three rounds of stroke play, I mean, I, I am just so fascinated what some of these scores are going to be. And I can't wait to see who the, the last eight standing are and, and let's play it off. So I don't know. Do, do you guys, do you guys agree with the format changes? Do you like it or do we not like it? I love it. People are probably gonna have some nightmares from the U uh, S women's am a little bit. Cause it's so reminiscent of that. And I, that's fun. It's like, you're fighting to make that match play and that, tension and i think you know I, li- I, li- I like the half and half because you you're watching you're watching a player get tested in two different ways and to me that really proves what kind of what the best benchmark is for a champion yeah i agree i think this format change is amazing i think it's going to be like absolute incredible viewing on friday afternoon slash evening watching this playoff it's it, it honestly made me think of like yo you know, we have cuts in almost every professional event that there is. Why is there not a playoff for the, like, why isn't there just like a standing 60 people are making the cut? All right. So if there is a tie, wherever it is, those people that are ties, they're not all coming in or it's not that cut line is not moving around. Why aren't those guys playing off every Friday? Mm-hmm. Think of how cool that would be for, for TV viewership, for everything else, like out there, people truly playing for for their paycheck for it to be true like on the line because i think in today's modern day golf where it's just automatic you know paychecks of wherever you you rock up you're gonna get paid there's got to be a little bit more teeth in there and that's what i'm excited for this to show big i am too so just just so folks have the the tv times golf channel and peacock have coverage every day, 6 to 9 p.m. Eastern. So our our friends on the Eastern Seaboard, it's good primetime golf. Let me ask you guys this. You know, with an expanded field up to 96 names, there's there's certainly more of a chance that that final eight for match play, you know, you, you might have some names in there that aren't quote unquote household names. Is that okay? I know it's a risk we always run with match play. It, will there be reason to be discouraged if we don't have many of those marquee names uh, in the final eight come the weekend? What do you think, Cody? I think this format is perfect for people who are hot. They're they're riding a hot putter. They're whatever it is in their game, and that big names might not matter because if you look at the LPGA, they're 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 kind of separating themselves, right? I think right now you could say that there's almost this you, you, you have Nelly on top and then you have like the top 10 and the top 10 or what I would say is if if people are saying that they're not household names, they, they probably need to watch a little bit more of women's coverage. And then from 10 on, there's just kind of like this gap and you have all these floaters in there that tomorrow could be the next Lily Vu of last year you know, who just goes on this incredible streak. You had Lauren, our young hitter, yesterday and this weekend, absolutely having a, a dynamite weekend. And if if it's something that one of them can ride the momentum, match play is perfect for that. And an eight-person match play bracket is even better. Yeah. Jordan, uh, you, you mentioned the USAM. You know, this will give everybody flashbacks to that. I, I assume you like the format, right? It it. it won't quite matter who's left in that final eight come Saturday. I love it. And it gives you a chance to identify, you know, the makings of potential killers. And I, cause if you can dominate this format, I mean, chances are you're going to be dominating at some point for the rest of the season. You know, if you're eligible for the Solheim cup, that that's a very good indicator for success there too. And so, yeah, I, I think this format is going to show a lot. And I think it's fine if someone, the winner ultimate or the final eight end up being, you know, some newer faces, um, some unknown names. It's, it's a nice way to introduce, quite frankly, the women's game has had some great momentum. I think a week like this where it's able to platform some rising stars or, you know, someone who's been searching for that win for a long time, whoever it might be, may be is, is great. It's still a positive. Yeah. I agree with you guys. I, I, I think one thing that, we saw with past match play, you know, when you just get right into it, you could have people advance in match play. They didn't necessarily win their match. It was the other person played so shitty they lost the match. <laughs> and, and vice versa, we would have matches where, you know, somebody won shooting like eight under on their ball and somebody lost shooting 
six or seven under on their ball. And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a shame because somebody that's playing really good golf is getting eliminated early in the week. And so I just love that, you know, Hey, at least for this week, we're going to have the people playing the, the, the eight women playing the best golf, and, and we're going to get to see them compete each against each other in the match play portion. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. I, I was, again, I, I, I love seeing the LPGA make a change like this and try something new. I, I think that's something what we've been calling for, not only in like their match play formats, but across the board, right? Operationally, the more chances, the, the more they can try new things. I, I just truly believe they're going to stumble on some really good stuff. And so I, I, I wanted to shout that out as, as an example of like, Hey, they're, they're willing to kind of make a radical departure from the match play that we've always seen on the PGA tour and even the match play that we've seen up until this point on the LPGA tour. So kudos to them. Let me ask you this, Jordan, I'm going to put you on a spot. Who do you like winning the match play this week? Mm, got it. I like Allison Lee. I think Allison Lee's my pick. You know, I really like that pick. Doesn't she have like an MGM partnership too? I feel like she's somebody who spends mm -hmm. a lot of time in Vegas. Might be a potential yeah. home game situation for her. I'm sure she's familiar with Shadow Creek. Uh, I like that. You know, I was thinking somebody, a rookie we've talked very highly about. Uh, she's had a great start to this year. She she got that dog in her, I think. Gabby Ruffles? Oh, God, that's a great pick. Yeah, a great you know, one. It wasn't Gabby. I truly like Match play is so awesome, and it's so hard not to think of International Crown, Solheim Cup, everything else. But we've kind of kind of been waiting for, like, well, what's going on with Lynn? And from the last time that we talked about Lynn on the podcast, a friend of the program reached out and was like, hey, you guys used to hit, like, a basically a predominantly right-to-left ball flight. And for some reason, they decided to switch that this winter. And now she, like, only wants to hit fades. And... They're, they're trying to groove it in, and I guess she's shown really good signs, but I think somebody, like, you would love to see a Lynn jump out and and take this, uh, you know. So if, if it's not going to be, it's not Gabby for me, sign me up for Lynn. You know who's on the entry list, and it would be her season debut as Angel Yin. She has been battling an injury. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that she will indeed be playing. She's certainly not my pick to win, but uh, would would be awesome to see her back. Lynn's a great pick. I'm gonna go with Celine Boudier though. I, I'm I'm gonna take the French woman. I don't have much good reason why I'm taking her, but Nelly Corda will be playing. She'll be going for her fourth win of the year and her third in three weeks. If anything, you know, listening to some of the quotes from Scotty Scheffler this past week uh when he tried to win for the third straight time it's exhausting so as much as i would like to pick nelly i i just think this week's probably gonna be just a bit too much and a culmination of what have been really stressful weeks already so i, I i'm not expecting nelly to win if she were to win that would be even more freaking impressive and then thankfully all the women well unless they really like to play the week before a major after match play, everybody gets a week off. It'll, of course, be Masters week. All, all the golf world turns to that. And then they come back with the first major of the year in Houston at the Chevron Championship the week after that. So uh, this will be the last chance to see a lot of these women before we see them at the first major. So I'm, I'm excited about that as well. Randy, who's going to win the Chevron? I have no idea. Do I have to pick somebody right now? I, I yes, might. That's, that's why I asked the question. I want to yeah. know where you're at. Where Gut check where you at right now. Because the fact that you didn't say Nelly already is kind of shocking to me. I mean, she I know. Was, I'm... took third last year. She had a kind of a bad final round. Really, they were... I, I mean, I know Lilia had a, a... She ended up winning, but really it was Angel. And Nelly was trying to chase down Angel. And then when Angel kind of had her woes on that final day, you know... Miss Vu is there to to be there and pick it up, and we everybody kind of expected Nelly to do that. I just don't know your hesitation here and not immediately saying Nelly. Well, it's too obvious, and I guess wanting to be contrarian. I, I, you know, the other person that was in my mind, and it's not contrarian, but would be like a Lydia Ko, and and what style it would be to win a major, 
gain entry into the Hall of Fame. I mean, Lydia's played some pretty good golf this year. Gun to my head, if if I had to like bet my life savings on it, I would take Nelly at Chevron for sure. Jordan? I think Angel's going to do it. I think she's going to do it. If, uh, that's, a, it. that's a lot of pressure. You're putting on rest and not rehab. But she's taking much better care of herself. And I think she's very aware of her limits. And she's learned a lot from last year. I just, I got a good feeling. I think, I think arrested up Angel Yin is dangerous. I agree with you that arrested, arrested Angel is dangerous wherever you might stumble upon her at. And I hope it's Chevron. I mean, at last year, so many things were going right. And then it just was like, oh no, this is, this is potentially going to happen. Now she would be an amazing major champion and so good for, so good for like the game overall. Her yep. personality is absolutely awesome. It's just, it's just shocking, guys. I just don't don't know how you wouldn't pick Nelly. I'm trying. I was thinking through the majors this year too, and we talk about Lancaster and Sahali and the old course and Evian, and I'm like trying to think of like what what course doesn't really like suit somebody who hits the ball a long ways, like is really good with their irons and now can putt. Cody, and, I appreciate you staking your claim and Nelly right here, right now for all the major. <laughs> well, not for all of them. It's just like I'm trying to – when I was thinking of Chevron before I was going to make this bold prediction of of picking somebody who's, you know, won three times already this year. I don't think it's that bold <laughs> of a pick. It's just I was trying to, like, talk myself out of it, and I'm just like, well, where's – where am I going to talk myself out of it at? I, I'm totally with you. I, I think that's – the the thing with Nelly is her floor is so high and you're exactly right Cody in that we saw that last year at Chevron like she, she her ball striking is going to put her in and around the front page of the leaderboard and then it's just a matter of you know does she get the putts to drop does she you know how dialed is she with the wedges et cetera, et cetera. but she just has such a high floor where every venue every week is like oh yeah this should suit her you know like she she's she's gonna have a chance the the other thing that i thought of thinking back on the end of the ford championship too is who started that day with the lead and who held that lead through like the first six or seven holes and that was hoijo kim and she is such a steady like doesn't give anything up player and I, I, it was such a shocking final round from her. And then you go back and look at the numbers, and I'm like, oh, she, she only shot, she shot 71 and still finished at 16 under. And where did like Nelly come from putting this final round 65 together to just leapfrog all of them? And it was the first time, and and we've we joked about it in the past of Nelly's kind of similarities to a Colin Morikawa, and we used to think that she was kind of this dome golfer. Well. She's proven it the last two weeks, the last two events, that it doesn't matter what weather conditions, uh, turf, you you name it, she's she's got it. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I, I think that's what makes it so exciting is on the like this is what I think we've all wanted to see out of Nelly, and like it really might be happening right now. Th- this like step up to somebody that that could could i'm not saying she will but certainly could be dominating the women's game throughout this year i i I think that's i don't know that's just exciting big i think it's time to pay some bills hold on hold on real quick before uh before we have to pay some bills if, if you're keeping score at home by my math the following out of the current rolex top 10 will not be participating in las vegas uh lilia vu will not be there she's had some in like is is she going through a little bit of injury stuff again does anybody know for sure i think she is i'm trying to remember what grant friend of the program grant boone told me something about her i'll double check real quick okay so it's a shame we're not going to see lilia this week uh running in will not be there she's had a very busy schedule i'm not sure if she's missed missed an event yet um Jin Young Ko will not be there, and Charlie Hall will not be there. Oh, excuse me. And then also number 10, Jiu Lin will not be there. So missing some of the current top 10, but like we said, Nelly will be there. Celine Boutier, Minji Lee we get to see. 
uh, Lydia Ko. So it, it, we're still going to have a, a great field. And let's hope that, you know, amongst that final eight, we get some some exciting names. Some quick news and notes, Cody, while you're checking on that Lilia Vu news. I just wanted to say, if anybody missed it, Soyeon Ru has announced that Chevron will be her last event. She is retiring. She's a two-time major winner. Just one of the nicest personalities out on a tour that's that's filled with a lot of really good people. So that'll be something we can talk about come Chevron week. And then the Cincinnati tournament found a home. This was one that for the last two years had been at Kenwood Country Club. Yeah, they've announced that uh, TPC Rivers Bend, which is north of the city, is going to be the new venue at least this year. And honestly, I think it'd be a great venue year in and year out if they want to kind of move it every now and again to some one-off locations around Southwest Ohio. That would be cool, but I'm, I'm glad the Cincinnati tournament, you guys know that's near and dear to my heart. I'm glad they have a venue. I'm just hoping that really takes root and becomes a, uh, you know, a, a tournament that can build a legacy. So shout out to the know, king and, and Arnie Parmy design. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course I've actually never been to, and I've never played for how long it's been in Cincinnati and for how much time I've spent in Cincinnati. So former host of the Kroger classic on the PGA tour from 2002 to 2004, and then went to the Chiquita classic from 2010 to 2012. Yeah. So those would have been, God, I already forget what it is. Corn fairy now, but whatever it used to be. Yeah, they, they, nice, yeah. Nice seeing the people in Ohio in with uh, Big Banana. All right. That's, that's, I know you guys like your. <laughs> that's your Uncle Carl there. Lindner. Yeah, that's Uncle Carl. Uh, we could, God, that's a whole other podcast uh, talking about Shakita. But so um, I found something on Lilia real quick. So during the Asian swing, she actually ended up with drawing two weeks in a row. She was over in Asia and she was struggling the back injury, the same thing that kind of set, sidelined her post chevron and international crown last year so she ended up withdrawing from hsbc and then the china event blue bay lpga but she did play the last two weeks she played in la and then she played in arizona now i would say that this is a i i know nothing of if the injury is still there but just looking at it scheduling wise i don't think that she gains anything going and and playing guaranteeing herself three days of stroke play and then whatever happens on the weekend for match play getting only a single week off i i wouldn't be surprised if we see her kind of start to take these two week breaks just with the amount of travel and everything that they have coming up so there's nothing pointing that says that she's potentially going to be out of the chevron and defending her title but that's just kind of what it, I, I see at least from looking at the schedule Gotcha. You know who else is battling an injury, and I'm ashamed that we've kind of just glossed over it, is Ataya Titicum, which I didn't really put two and two together until right now. She was, she's been diagnosed back in February with like this tendon issue in her left thumb, and I guess doctors told her to sit six to eight weeks. She has not played on the LPGA Tour this year, and she's not entered in Las Vegas, so I don't know if we'll see her at Chevron. I certainly hope we do, but yeah, that's an absence. I, the way she played last year and being 21 years old, I, that was somebody that we thought was going to have a monster year, so I, I hate that she's dealing with an injury right now as well. Yeah, I'm looking at a... Uh... A golf week article here that beth ann wrote at the end of february that said that she was planning on returning back to the tour late march obviously that's not the case yeah she planned on returning to action for the ford championship and and she wasn't there she's not in the field this week so i don't know maybe just giving herself an extra couple of weeks and hopefully we see her in houston i know hopefully yeah all right cody we have any more bills to pay yeah you want to talk about golf clubs <laughs> I'd love to. It's my favorite thing. This is, of course, brought to you by our friends at Titleist <laughs> and the four tier T series iron models the T100, T150, T200, and the T350. Jordan, the evolution of T series is the direct product of an endless cycle of player improve, player input on every facet of iron performance control, distance, flight, forgiveness, looks, sound, and feel. Speaking of sound, our guy, Sweet Baby Neil, in that awesome Titleist video they got put out. 
out there with his, uh, you know, freezer mitts and, and earmuffs and everything else like that. Titleist is able to make improvements that golfers value most. The key to unlocking that performance is by getting fit and finding the right T-Series model and blended set or blended set that is dialed in for your game. Working with a Titleist fitter will help you maximize your carry distance and create consistent distance gaps, hone in your left and right misses, and optimize your descent angle into the green so you can stop that ball closer to the hole more consistently. Everybody, please head over to Titleist.com to learn more, find a fitter or fitting event near you now fun fact as we transition to the next part of this podcast jordan titleist was the most played irons at last year augusta national women's amateur that's what we'd like to hear we're finally going to augusta it's spring in the south let's talk a little uh high level women's amateur golf what do we got jordan guys i wish i had put that little piece of uh factoid in my trivia that would have been awesome I know. Um, I think I would have maybe gotten one of the questions right. I'm, I'm worried I might be <laughs> blanked otherwise. Yeah. So best week of the year is here. As I mentioned earlier, it is the Anwa, the Anwa guys, not the Anwa, the Anwa. You guys have me saying Anwa mentally in my head and Thanks. I catch myself and I'm like, no, it's Anwa. It is Anwa, Anwa, Anwa. And I think I'm ruined now. I'm ruined now. I don't know who started on well between either one of you, but I'm a little upset. Anyway. Um, I think, well, I think the green jackets need to make an official declaration on what it is. I, I've never heard officially whether it's supposed to be Anwa or Anwa. Because I think both are perfectly acceptable pronunciations. I think I'm going to get some clarification on this, and I will report Actually, back. That's some good Ooh. reporting, Jordan. That's yeah. some good Back-checking reporting for you this yeah. week. Yeah, JP. Yeah, I, 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 want, I want an answer, too. I'm going with Anwa. I think it's Anwa. Anyway, moving on. Let me jump in, JP, for real quick. You're, you're on the grounds this week. What's, what's the plan? I know you want to do some writing, but w- what also have you written? I, I tell the people what you've been working on the last several months. Oh, yeah. So... Last uh, last few months, I've been working on a profile on Amari Avery, and I'm really excited for it to come out. We were just about to tie the bow on it and put it out for the world. But yeah, Amari's been someone I've been covering for a few years, and I've always been really captivated by it. just as a player, but as a person too. I kind of went into this thinking a lot of her story had kind of been left untold and wanting to kind of dig into like the value of her going to college instead of turning professional and what that did for her. And I learned that the past two years of Amari Avery's life spent in college have really shown more about her than any Netflix documentary or any previous coverage did in her entire life. And it was so fun to really dig into that. And Just a culmination of having watched her at the Curtis Cup a few years ago, having watched her at the U.S. Women's Open last year, I started seeing like a lot of connected tissue in terms of the person she was becoming and just this, you know, this kind-hearted, fearless woman who was able to grow into her own and kind of redefine her why and understand the reason that she played golf because it's, it's, a lot of it is still the same as when she was a kid, but a lot of it is different as well. And so... Um, that was a really fun story to write. Um, excited for it to be out there. Uh, hope, uh, hope the people like it. Uh, it was a fantastic read. I think I'll, I'll lead with that there. And for people who haven't checked it out, please, it's, it's, it'll be up on our website. I think my question is, since you started really following golf and, and taking it seriously as like, you know, putting your big J journalist hat on, why was it? Amari, because even before you pitched this idea, it was always something. And I know you, you've said that you've been fascinated with kind of her development and everything else like that. But were these seeds that were planted early on? Did obviously Netflix had a lot of of her, you know, exposure to the rest of the world. But where where is this? Are there similarities between the two that you, you guys are you're kind of searching for? Or, or what is it trying to get you to breathe a little bit more here, Jordan? Between her and the Netflix persona is what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. There's still a little bit of that firepower to her, but it's manifested in different ways. Um, She's matured a lot. Her game has only really gotten better, but she's seen a lot of highs and lows to get there. 
I think what's the most fascinating part of all this, and I think there's just to me, there's just a lot of really cool components, but I think having been under such intense scrutiny and having been considered probably the most polarizing part of that doc documentary in terms of the tension between her and her father and, you know, working to win U.S. kids and how much time and devotion and energy she put into that. I think watching her grow up and be, you know, not only just so graceful, but so just so intelligent and so still so dedicated to golf and not losing sight of what she actually wanted. And again, just redefining what that meant to her and why she wanted it and why she was putting all this time into it. Because there's a lot of people that play this game, especially at the amateur game. And even at this level that, you know, they put all this time, but they don't really understand their why. They're kind of just in it because they put all this time into it. And they're like, well, hey, like, might as well keep the train going. And for Amari, it's a real sincere love for golf. And uh, that was cool. And because it's hard. I mean, growing up, up in the spotlight and having people kind of conflate who you are as a 20 year old versus you at nine years old, that's, that, that's a tough, tough thing to break out of. And so for me, I was like, well, who's that 20 year old? I want to know. I think you did an awesome job of, of there's obviously for people who are familiar with her from the Netflix show, like there is a, a very powerful relationship between her and her father. And I think when you talk about somebody being thrusted onto the spotlight that early, like, you know, Amari was probably like, yeah, I love, I love playing golf and I love going to these tournaments, but like, she probably didn't have the choice or a say in, do you want your, your story blasted? Or do you want to be called Tigress and be like these huge lofty comparisons? And now it's so awesome to see her take control of like her life and, and figure out how she wants to go about things, but still have like a seemingly really good relationship, like with everybody around her. Like there's, it doesn't seem to be like crazy bitterness, or resentment or anything else like that, that you see happen with a lot of people, younger people when they're thrusted into the spotlight, like, like that. It can be so easy to end up right. Having that bitterness, having that resentment, you know, and that translating into everything and seeing her and just the way that she's developed, I think was, was just, it's, it's just powerful. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm really excited for this to be out there. Uh, I don't want to spoil it too much, but, um, there, there's some really cool poignant moments and um, aspects of it that I, I thought really showed a lot of awesome character development on her end. Oh, it was fantastic work. Would would point everybody towards nolayingup.com. You can find Jordan's piece. Great reporting, Jordan. Very happy that you can be with us and, and working on projects like that. So kudos to you. Uh, as we look forward to Anwa, though... <laughs> We'll give you Amari Avery as one name to watch. I, I know you're you're also writing about you know some some names to watch this week, but I don't know. Let's let's talk about maybe your five other favorite names that that you're curious to see this week. This is an interesting Anwa because we're in a bit. We're navigating a few things. We're navigating the post Rosang era, which kind of took the world by storm. We do not have the the the. I put in quotes defending champion because she's not defending anything. She's, she's gone. She's out of here. Um, Roseanne, not not defending a title. So we have empty podium for someone to come in here and snatch it, and take it for themselves. And I think that's great. We only have one returning champion this year, and that is Anna Davis. We previously had Subasa Kajitani in the field, but she withdrew last week. Um, so it will only be Anna Davis as a returning champion. And just kind of thinking on some names in navigating this post Rosang era, it's interesting. So we look at the best player in the world right now, and that's Ingrid Lindblad. And it's well-deserved. She's had an incredible college career. She's won 14 times, won last week, um, won stage two Q school last year, and still elected to stay amateur. Has really loved the amateur game and has been vying for some of these big name titles. But it, it I... I think it's hard to compare Ingrid and Rose's dominance because Ingrid's has kind of been spread out over the past five years, whereas Rose kind of was contained into more two, three more or less, if you count a little bit before her college career. So I think they're dominant in two different ways. Now, this course has kind of brought the, did bring the best and worst out of, or I'm sorry, these two courses brought the best and worst out of Rose Zang, but it's done the same for Ingrid Lidblad. 
And I think that's going to serve her extremely well. She kind of mentioned last um, last week in like a pre-tournament presser, she was like, yeah, like, you know, I wasn't playing bad last year necessarily. It, it just, I just didn't have it. Like, and I remember she was very emotional when she didn't make the cut last year. I mean, she was just really, really beside herself. It was, it really beat her up, but she bounced back and she kept plugging along for the rest of this LSU season and has played great. And I think that kind of resilience is going to serve her well. So Yes, it's so easy to default to the best player in the world, but hard not to give Ingrid Lindblad her flowers. I mean, she's done phenomenal. Um, just it's just sustained greatness, truly. Can every ounce of her game? I feel like is really set, sets up well for Augusta. I mean, she's almost done it before, guys. Like I, I just yeah, she's just as she's a, really good. <laughs> yes, I, I look. I'm floored. I cannot find the words, but she, she's just wow. That number one ranking is well deserved. And um, she's your, she's your high LSU pick because uh, there, there's not a lot of mention of somebody who, who should have won this event before, and that's Latana. Latana, yeah, Latana, and and Latana still sustained some pretty good play. She had that incredible U.S. Women's Am run last fall. Is also someone you should look out for. It's in this field. I think this will most likely be her last time now. Um, but someone else who has a great game for on one whose game's only getting better. What's interesting, guys, I want to point something out here. Our best players in the world aren't really Americans. We've, things have changed a lot in the past year. Yep. We've had, and I kind of want to contextualize this when we're navigating the post Rosang era, as we're, we're doing this all together. Um, it's it's interesting. We're we're trying to usher in this kind of like new generation of great Americans because we've got a we're in a Curtis Cup year. We're still kind of figuring out who that is, who who's exactly the dominant person, what's there. And the best Americans right now, they're very good, but they they're they're still relatively new to like this scene in a sense. So we've got I'll just point some of them out and I because I do think they are names that we should be considering, even though they don't even land in the top five. Like the best American right now is number seven on Wagger, Megan Scofel, who won the US Women's Am, who's great. But then you jump to ten, Zoe Campos, who I feel like probably should be ranked higher. I mean, she's just been flat out amazing this college season. Um, she went already won twice this spring. In, insane. So good. I'll point out the top five, top five Americans. We'll, we'll keep it to that. Um, so it was Megan Scopel, Zoe Campos, Amanda Sandbach from Virginia, uh, Rachel Keen, who might, we might know from previous Anwas, Curtis Cups, yeah. and Dana Davis. Netflix. Don't forget about, you know, oh, yes. Alex, little, yeah. little Baby Fitz's girlfriend. Little Baby Fitz's girlfriend. Yeah, well, no, I, we're, we're not going to label her with that. She's, she's greatness all on her own. <laughs> she's amazing. <laughs> She's awesome. Yeah. And then Anna Davis, past champion. So it's interesting when we look at that and we look right into the Curtis Cup year, which is in September, and we think of qualifying. And this is one of the biggest litmus tests all year because it's this and NCAAs, if you play NCAA golf, which all of these women do. And then you have the US Women's Am. And I think whoever wins this, I think should by default get an invite. I think Wagner is going to keep them there anyway, because, mm -hmm. well, we'll get to why that that will be the case in our trivia. But let's get out of stateside a little bit. Let's get out of there. Let's go international because that's where it's really happening, guys. That is where the killers are. Okay, um, some names that I think we need to keep a close eye on: Julia Lopez Ramirez from Mississippi State is the goods, guys. So good. Jordan, I don't what? want to group group all these together, no. but just looking looking at international specifically players that are finishing up or, or getting close to finishing up their amateur playing days, which we would assume that they're a, a majority of them are going to turn professional and try to play. In the next four to six years, the United States Schoolheim Cup team is in a lot of trouble, and we talk a lot on this podcast about the Swedes that are coming. But I, out of nowhere, where did all these Spaniards come from? Because obviously, uh, Julia Lopez Ramirez is, is probably leading the block, but like going down, not only Wager but results so far in in college, it's it's truly phenomenal. And 
Spanish golf has just kind of burst onto the scene like a, an actual powerhouse. They have four or five, I think, in the top 20 in the world right now. It's, it's truly mm-hmm. amazing to see. They, they are taking over. They're all over the SEC. They are funneling into the dying Pac-12. I mean, they are just <laughs> – so it's a valid question, Cody. Like, in, in, in terms of the context of the Solheim Cup, I always think Curtis Cup, and it's like we there's no room for them on the Curtis Cup, which is so infuriating because they are some of the best players in the world. And if we were really testing the best players in the world, they would be competing head-to-head, but that's a rant for another day. What was interesting, one particular player that stuck out to me, she's not in the top 20, she's just outside. But I got a chance to go to the Meadow Club Collegiate a few weeks ago up in San Francisco. And I got to watch Paula Martin San Pedro. And oh my gosh, she is a flusher. She's so good. Um, It was interesting because the day that I watched her, uh, she was having some trouble with her putter. But she held out for me for Eagle from a bunker. And I was like, girl. No, like love her. She's at Stanford for a reason, guys. She's at Stanford. Not only, yeah. not only at Stanford, but like you know, defending team, national champions. Uh, you know, Rose obviously was individual coming in with an absolute stacked roster, and Paula as a, a a true freshman is far and away their number one player. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy to see. Yeah, she is going to kind of carry that torch, especially as they go into their postseason and whatnot her and Sadie Engelman specifically I think yep. are the best players on that team but focusing yeah on like this Spanish contingent I mean if you if you have an animal pick if you don't have an animal pick yet you should kind of lean this way truly um because and especially Stanford Stanford on that front in terms of recruiting they're picking up the Spaniards and the Swedes they and Walker is doing the work she knows where the yeah. talent is the recruiting goddess yes all right who, who else you got for us who, who else do I need to watch well, we talked enough about Amari. We talked a lot about Amari. And I did get to watch her at Meadow Club. So that was kind of the last tournament that she played before she played in law. And I have to say the game is looking really good. Very good. Hitting the ball really well. Set up a lot of trouble with her putter over the years. Putter looked great. Just making all the putts possible. Feels like she's primed to make some noise. And she's contended at this championship before. That's great news. Um, she plays a game that really contrasts from a lot of the players in this field. I mean, I was watching her at Meadow Club and she was like sitting and waiting on par fives for people like, all right, you guys done? Whatever. She's really got the game, I think, to contend again this year uh, when she struggled a lot last year. And thinking just in the context of, you know, some players that I we've seen, generally speaking, play well, um, Maria Jose Marin from... Colombia, she's really good. She made the cut last year. Um, she's dominated the college scene as a freshman. She's one to keep an eye on. Gianna Clement is always meant for bigger moments, I feel. is always rises up to the test. I remember I spoke to her after she played on the last year, and she reflected on it a lot. And she felt kind of, I don't want to say she was obsessed with Anwa, but she like had kind of taken it all in so much and was like, I, I modeled the way that I play my game. She basically was saying, like, she modeled the way that she got better at the game off of what she did at Anwa. So someone who's talking like that is trying to win one of these things. Gianna Clement, for sure. There's another 15-year-old out there, too, that's about to make her uh, Anwa debut. A young American, not, not on very many lists, but did just win the Junior Invitational at Sage Valley. Asterix Tally. I mean, it seems like everything that we got, very, very excited. Talking about Gianna Clemente last year, I mean, Asterix is just kind of filling in right there and being like, okay, if you're going to do it, I'm going to do it too. Yeah. Like, let's, let's go figure this world out together. Sage Valley and On will have some good overlap too. Yeah. As Anna Davis previously won at Sage Valley as well. It's crazy to me, you know, we've just hearing you talk, but there are so many what I would consider like big names in this Anwa field that, you know, we might not even met like a, a, somebody like Mega Gane, right? that most of us remember for that amazing U.S. Open she had several years ago. She's in the field. You have a Yana Wilson, who is incredible. Like, this is, uh, Jordan, this has to be, like, every year this field just has to get deeper and deeper, right? I I would imagine this year is no exception. I think on the international side, it's gotten a lot deeper. I wouldn't say on the American side. Now, 
they, that kind of gets into a different debate with how Wagger weighs different events and whatnot. But I would say on the international side, it surely is the strongest that I've ever seen it. On the American side, it's gotten a little bit weaker. And so I, I think they need to step up to the plate. So if, if the Americans want to make a statement, especially going into a Curtis Cup year and at large, Solheim Cup implication, someone's got to win this. But we'll see. Yeah. For sure. I probably the last event or, or time that we'll see Jensen Castle. Um, I'm trying to think who else Americans that have played in this kind of year over year. Um, obviously, Rachel Heck, it'll be out unless there's some form of, of different exemption going on. But I know Jensen probably going to turn professional. She played in Q school last year. Uh, Anna Morgan in the same boat, you know, done with college, went to Q school last year, didn't end up making it, but they eventually will turn term professional um one person biggie you're gonna recognize his name charlotte heath i don't know if you remember following her around last I year do. i do yeah excited yeah. to see her um it's crazy you're right the international players that are in this field now it, it's so cool to see it's so awesome to see the depth of this and i remember talking about this event in years past and being like well like the bottom of it how did they really get in here there's a lot of crazy picks and everything and that's not really the case anymore like these are all hit hitters only mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very little. no i mean that's that's what i think i was going at I, I you know somebody like just to pull a name like anna morgan anna morgan somebody that i know right and i'm not like yep. super into amateur golf but I, i've seen her a few years now bailey shoemaker right this will mm -hmm. be her third event on the international side isla galitsky is a super talented teenager from thailand yeah thailand yeah i i just feel like it's fun and, and i think this is where anwa helps itself right the more you watch and, and you start to learn some of these names and then you see them for another year or two before they turn pro i feel like that cycle is we've had enough of them now to where it's fun like i'm starting to recognize so many names and i think that makes for a great event Randy, I know you love your dark horses. Bailey Shoemaker would be a good one. She's hitting the ball very well right now. Yeah. So, all right, Jordan, be before we all make picks and do all that, you, you said you had some trivia for Cody oh, no. and I. Yeah. You I hit us with some do. trivia. I do, guys. Okay. So, for five years into this thing, I think we've got enough history to do some trivia. The winner, I will send I will send you an Ant Anwa Trinket. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. If you not, have my attention. That uh, add, added some firepower to your neuron. I hope so. So let's get into it. So my first question, we'll go with an easy one. In what year was the very first ANWA contested? Is this like a race to be first? <laughs> Cody, okay. yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yay, we tied. Yeah. Okay. It's a trick question because they, they missed a year with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was, no, it was 2019. No, I know. So just, but this is the fifth ANWA this year, right? Yes. But that's yeah. still the first. Wait, what? Now you're confusing me. 19, no. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. This should be the sixth. But what I'm saying is because of COVID, it's actually only the fifth. Yeah. Reminds me of that bodyboard, bodybuilding forum where the guy was arguing about how many, how many days of the week. Yeah. Or days of the week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're actually eight days of the week. <laughs> Uh, okay, what's next? How many playoffs have there been for the Anwa title? One. Two. Cody, you're right. Yeah, I think it was last year. And then, of course, oh, our shit, girl Amelia lost to uh, Subasa, right? Yeah. Yep. Extra credit. I, I forgot last year. I forgot Rose was in a playoff. Darn. Okay. Cody's up 2 nothing. How many pass? Well, if you if you don't get this right, you were listening. How many past champions are in the field this year? Oh, one. Go ahead, big. One. All right, two one. And a who is it? Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah, A clo close personal friend. Yeah. Which major championships She's will the winner impressed. be eligible for? Three of them. Everything. Did you say which or yeah. how many? No, which one? So you said which. I thought it was, I was going to go with three as well. For some reason, I was like, oh, uh, I figured oh, no. that. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm going to I'm going to go with one. And I think it's the. Is it the U.S. Women's Open? 
So I know they're not eligible for KPMG because they don't have amateurs there. And we know Chevron because it's happening too close. Three possible. Actually, I'm going to take well, but away. I think, the, I think that was part of them moving away, like the the ANA or Chevron. Hmm. I'm going to guess one. I'm going to guess Evian. Come on, guys. It's four. What? Why did you say which? That you I, leading us. Teacher, no, you're a bad teacher. No, I'm not. I told you. Yeah. The substitute four. teacher is cheating, which Mr. One? Big. Nope. All right. So well, hold on, four. hold on. Are they eligible for this year's Chevron or does it roll to 2025? As far as I read, it's this year's Chevron. Okay. Yeah, I guess I get a week off and then go to Houston. Okay. Yeah. Somebody gets that no, one. Cody's up to one. The only one that they're not into, I'm guessing, is uh, KPMG yep. women's. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. for anyone listening, U.S. Women's Open, the 2024 Women's Open, Chevron, and Evian. Okay. Well, maybe the joke's on you because we're not uh, – sometimes we don't recognize the Chevron and Evian as, <laughs> as majors. Mm, right. Indeed. Don't – no, don't, don't, don't invalidate those at the end. That's low. All right, fifth question. How many lefties have won Emma? One, Anna Davis. Yep. Correct. Two, two. Aside from the United States, which is the second most represented country in Emma this year? I'm saying Japan. Lock it in. S Spain. It is Japan. There are nine. No! Nine. Spain has eight. That was a good guess, Cody. Oh, good I took job, a three-two lead. Yeah, you know. I want that trinket. All right, George. Next question. <laughs> Who holds the tournament record for the lowest fifty-four hole score in Amla history? We need a hint. I'm happy to give one. No, no hint. I'm gonna guess Jennifer Cupcho. Sabasha Kachatani. Randy, you are correct. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> okay. I remember her going low that first year. All right. Mm -hmm. Damn, it's getting six, late. It's it's getting yeah. later for you, Cody. 68, 71, 67 for 206. This should be the eighth question. This is the eighth question. Who holds the record for the lowest 18 hole score on either course? That's a good question. Way to go with Rose. Was it Rose last year, like that first round? Yes. It was? Yep. Okay, good. I didn't even need to guess. Good one, Cody. Yep. 64-3. Two to go. Cody needs both of oh, them. This is close. I love this, guys. Let's go. All right. Previously, Anwa would hold a playoff to determine the top 30 players who would play Augusta National in the final round. When was the final year of that? 2022 last year 2023 you're correct cody oh god last year they all brought you, you whoever was on that number come on yeah Bring no that's what over. i mean i thought that's what the question was asking no but last year they the last year that they played it was 2022 like that they changed it for the 2023 playing don't try to take this victory away from mm, me i think right, we're tied been problematic Cody, question. just all right last dang. one you know what you both studied up like i'm really proud but well you had us right. nervous here's the last one here's the last one for the trinket there, the undetermined trinket there are two past champions who have a lot of overlap world number one ncaa individual champions name them rose and jennifer thank you i will give you my new address jordan <laughs> quickness whatever whatever you're buying make sure that you just invoice it back to him <laughs> so he's he's paying for it anyway and they have a really good shipping setup at the uh, merchandise you headquarters you can much. charge that as well congratulations mr big uh yeah for some reason i was sitting there and i'm like rose end rose end and it just it didn't just didn't come you're right you always got cup show on the brain big i know you. yep yep guys he's a denverite just like me you guys crushed it. I'm so proud. Well, thank you. Quick pick to win. Cody, who you got? 
Ooh, there's a lot of directions we could go here. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be one of like the favorites. I'm I, I, that's a lot of pressure on Ingrid. I don't. I wish she would, but I don't think it's really going to happen. I'm going to go with the the freshman, the Stanford freshman. I think it's it's her game is is rounding into form. Everybody on the Stanford team just boasts about her and how how competent she is, how level headed she is at such a young age. That's Paula Martin San Pedro, which I'm very, very excited about. I think I'm going to impress Jordan with my pick. Jordan, I, I would really like for you to be impressed with this. I think she's in fantastic form. And that's Scotland's Hannah Darling, my official pick to win. And I feel really good about it. Hannah's a dog. I love that. I love that. It's the hardest question ever. Um, I don't know. Mm, yeah I'm big, not... well, well she, big while jordan thinks about it you're not concerned at all i mean she this is going to be hannah's third uh appearance here the first year she made the cut but did not play very good at augusta national last year did not didn't didn't even make it over from champions i know this is one of those things that you get more experience with time but i mean it's got to kind of be a concern there especially at a an event that has pretty good luck for for first timers yeah, that is interesting. I what outweighed that was I see that she won. Didn't she just win Sage Valley? She won the Darius Rucker. Oh, the Darius Rucker. She won the Darius Rucker. I, I I think she finished runner up also at like the Valspar Augusta Invitational. It says yes. she got into the Palace Verdes LPGA event a couple weeks ago. I, I just think she's playing really good golf. And she's had some like winning experiences. She's played. I'm sure she was nervous at Palace Verdes. You know, she's she's played recently with great nerves. I, I like all that for her going into this week. All right, Jordan. We got you some time. Who's gonna win it this year? <laughs> you know, you Cody, you bought me time, but I was there just invested in Randy's explanation for why he was picking Hannah Darling. Guys. I think I, I think I'm gonna go with Maria Jose. Like she, her first year, she came out and she just absolutely dominated champions. I mean, she just looks so solid. She she and she plays like someone who is you know five years her senior. I and she's got a lot of time left if if she continues to remain an amateur. I mean, she's got a lot of time left playing these. But either way, if she doesn't win this year, she's gonna win one of them. So Maria Jose Marin from Arkansas. All right, there you have it. Cody, we have a fun new partner joining us this week, don't we? That's right, we do. We want to uh, welcome, I think we're we're making the formal announcement on the, the regular Masters historical overview that Solly and KVV, KVV did, but that is Mizuho, right? You, you, you guys might have heard of Mizuho before. They're the top global corporate and investment bank. They're a powerhouse in Japan the retail space in Americas are the fastest growing region for Mizuho globally. Uh, and it's the only institutional business in the Americas. If you're an average golf watcher, you've probably seen a couple of their commercials. You're familiar with their brand ambassadors, uh, specifically Michelle Wee West. She's featured in their title sponsor uh, commercial of her and her caddy kind of goofing around in the Mizuho office space. It's awesome. They're also the title sponsor of the Mizuho Americas Open. This is going to be the second playing of it this year. That's May 16th through the 19th, the same week as the PGA Championship. But last year, great champion in Rose Zhang making her professional right. debut. She will be there to defend her title, not only uh, at Liberty National, but also as a Mizuho ambassador. Very, very excited about that. Uh, the Mizuho America's Open also fe features amateurs playing with the pros, they got they've increased that purse there to three million dollars. They cover their accommodations uh, They got partner summits, girls summits, you name it, everything going uh, on the, the girls summit in partnership with Girls Inc. That's all about Mizuho. We're very, very excited to have them on. And this is our new Mizuho winning advice segment. We could not be happier about that. What it is, is that. You know, we talk a lot about the players out there, the players that are doing, obviously hitting the shots, making the putts, but it takes a team of people around them, and that's what Mizuho is, is there for. 
They can be your team when you need it, if you need financial advice or anything else like that. So to kick this off, I pulled up a little bit of footage talking about our newest LPGA champion, uh, a woman, a newly minted aunt who won back-to-back tournaments on the LPGA Tour, talking about the team around her, and then we're going to uh, discuss afterwards. When I rolled that putt in on nine, I was one back, and um, my uh, my caddy, actually, Jason, told me that I was one back. I didn't know, and um, that's when we kind of dialed in a little bit more, um, just made sure that we went through the process of every shot, and, um, yeah, just played some really solid golf coming in, too. So to have done what you've done on the golf course the last three times you've teed it up, I mean, can you just put into words what it means to see this much of your hard work pay off and this much success this quick in the year? I think you're, again, one of a handful of players to win before April 1st three times in a row, which is insane. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm out on the golf course, but I have a whole team behind me that um, I couldn't have done them done it without them. Um, when it comes to my family, um, the support system that I have with them, and then when it comes to my team, um, I'm just the player, but I have a whole group behind me that is helping me lead the way. Um, and I think that I can't thank them enough, and my success is their success. Guys, there's there's a lot to unpack there, but I think, relatively speaking, it's something that we rely on in our everyday lives too. But is there anything that stuck out to you uh, from Nelly's answers there? I think, uh, listen, I, I think what Nelly communicated there is something that we have heard or I have heard pretty much every professional golfer say at some point and i think it's something that often gets overlooked by folks at home you know you, you flip on your tv on sunday and and you're watching whatever tournament it is and it just seems very glamorous being a a touring professional golfer but what is hard to realize is just the grind of the lifestyle going from city to city and just how impossible that would be to do that by yourself, right? To, to, to be like a singular isolated person having to do that. And so, yeah, you, you learn and, and Nelly said it perfectly there, like how important those people are that travel week to week and, you know, however many weeks a year you're on, on the road, you have to have people around you that you like, you enjoy, uh, that push you, that challenge you, that that let you vent. I mean, I, I can't imagine being, it just would seem impossible to be a professional golfer without a strong support system. So I, I think it's no coincidence that the best golfers also have really good teams that work for them. And it's it's honestly nice to hear Nelly, you know, realize that in the moment and and shout those people out. I thought it was really mature. Um, it's interesting yeah, that's because... What, that's what stuck out to me too. I was like, oh man, like, yeah, good on you. Yeah, no? yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because we look back at Nelly last year and I think my biggest concern was that she's getting complacent with where she is in golf. I mean, like, you know, she just kind of don't know if she's a killer. All those questions kind of came up and it's obvious the people that she has around her and who surround her week to week, day to day, haven't let her get that way. And that was the only way that she was going to come out and perform so strongly this year and that sense of gratitude and you know selflessness on her part to make that acknowledgement I thought was great and I think it you know that team is just is a huge part of the recipe and it's uh it's nice nice to see her uh give them the props yeah, it's not like uh, the majority of the men's professional leagues that are out there, the the women are not going to the nearest FBO and, and loading on their private jet. They're, they're truly caddy becomes uh, not only everything that they provide on the course, but lead sandwich maker, chauffeur, uh, designated driver at times. Um, and, you know, the, the women are literally traveling the globe with them. And if they don't have this tight relationship and bond and truly somebody that they can rely on for every facet of their life, you know, they, they kind of be lost. And it's awesome to hear somebody like Nelly, uh, you know, give kudos where kudos are due. But again, guys, thank you to Mizuho, 
You can find more information on them by visiting MizzouHoAmericas.com. Mr. Big. Yeah, and I will say it's an excellent event up at Liberty National. It, it was a good event last year. Uh, if you're in the New York area this May, check it out. Cody, thank you. Jordan, thank you. Have a wonderful time in Augusta this week. Uh, our guy Tron Carter is going to be joining you this weekend. Everybody tune in Sunday night to our recap pod. It will, of course, be uh, on what heavy. Um, before we go, we have one more segment, and it's a segment that Cody and I recorded last week, and it's with Rachel Heck. We have about a 20, 25-minute conversation with Rachel. Of course, again, if you missed it on our website, Rachel published a piece entitled Why I'm Remaining an Amateur. It's her own words. It's I, I thought it was a really just awesome piece uh, full of wisdom about her journey and her realization about why professional golf is not going to be for her. And so we talked to her a little about that. We talked to her just about how she's feeling, you know, how, how the body is heading into, heading into Anwa this week, um, catch up with her on, on school stuff and just a lot of different subjects. Rachel is pretty much the, the most positive person, always upbeat in a good mood. And, and I think you'll find that, uh, with her talking to Cody and myself. So Cody, anything to add there before we sign off? No, it was great to catch up with her. Uh, you know, clearly had some struggles. She's very open and honest about it, the whole thing. If you haven't, please go read the piece on the website. Uh, and good luck to her. Hopefully she has a, a good, oh, we'll see, but hopefully not final showing. You never know what, what changes with, uh, you know, entry procedures and everything else like that. But Biggie, thanks for having me on your podcast, buddy. Of course. Uh, here is our conversation with Rachel Heck. Rachel, it, it's so nice to be able to get to talk. Uh, first things first, how are you today? I'm great. How are y'all? Thanks all for having me again. Of course, of course. We're doing well. Well, I can't speak for Cody, but I assume Cody's, uh, <laughs> Cody's doing well. We're doing great, guys. Yeah. Well, thank you for making time. I know this is obviously going to be a very <laughs> busy week, um, as I'm sure each week as you wind down your college career is going to be busy, but we appreciate you taking time. Of course, Anwa is coming up. I, Rachel, I got to start right here. I was just thinking about this prior to hit and record. I say Anwa. I know some people say Anwa. Where do you fall <laughs> in the Anwa, Anwa? Uh, Definitely debate? Anwa. Anyone who says Anwa is just, just wrong. Hey, there we go. That's what I like to hear too. Yeah. Okay. Good. That makes me. That makes me feel uh, a lot better. I'll probably say it differently throughout this interview, so that'll be fun to to keep track of. Oh, yeah. But let's start here, Rachel. How, how how are you feeling? How how's the body holding up, and and how's the golf game coming into what will be your third Anwa? Yeah, not too bad. Hopefully, I've kind of taken it super light this winter. Um, not really playing a lot to hopefully save my body for anwa postseason so we'll we'll see you know i haven't obviously gotten to play as much as i would want to um i'm about to go play a tournament in arizona we leave in like an hour and a half and we we're kind of debating before like should i should i play this one should i try to save you know what i can play for anwa but then we decided like going to anwa after not playing for oh a minute it's gonna <laughs> probably not ideal so um and just to play for the team again is gonna be gonna be fun so yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, good, bad. I don't know. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, let's let's dive in a little bit there. You, what has your practice routine been able to be like? I, what is your day to day in terms of golf and what you're able to do <laughs> now, and and how much has that changed over the course of the last couple of years? I guess. Yeah, it's definitely changed pretty significantly. Before, I could just be out there as long as I wanted to, hit balls all day, like. Um, you know, I guess I'm old now and, you know, I can't do that anymore, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I try to just use my time super efficiently now. Now it's like an hour to two hours with a couple days off. And I try to spend as much time on the course as possible. Um, every golfer knows that hitting on the range is very different than, than looking at a narrow fairway. So I'm trying to, trying to just be really efficient and find a system that works, which usually looks like chipping and putting, playing a few holes, like a 15 minute range session, but you know, I've started, I I think I've maybe played one or two actual full rounds of golf. So since yeah. when? One one or two since when? I don't even want to answer that question. Um, like a few months. Okay. Uh, tournament, but 
yeah yeah it's kind of it's definitely hard to you know I'm competitive and it's frustrating I want to just be able to you know do everything to feel feel confident and prepared but we you know discuss with my trainers my physical therapist like that's not really an option anymore so we um trying to find something that works how have you been able to balance like because obviously you're just talking about the mental side of it and how you're such a competitor and you want to be out there and you want to be hitting balls and practicing and getting all this prep in but the physical limitations that you have now so how have you been able to figure out this balance or is it is it been just a struggle and then that's okay to say at times like it's this is yeah. this is a very very hard difficult place not only like in your life but in your golfing life too I, can, I could not even imagine how you wake up every day being like no I can go do this and your body's just telling you no yeah yeah it's definitely frustrating um you know there'll be it's you know not a linear path um clearly since surgery there's been a lot of ups and downs and even the past few weeks like I'll play, we had an 18 old match against SJSU and I played that and I felt great. I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm healed now. Like I'm good to go. <laughs> and then the couple of days after that, I was like super sore and really hurting. I'm like, okay, I got to take a step back again. So it's really hard mentally to not get ahead of myself every time I have a couple of days where I feel great. Um, but I mean, my teammates, my coaches, all of our training, um, the doctors here, like they're just incredible and they really, um, Help, help me find a system that, you know, hopefully works. I guess we don't really know until I play. But also, it's, I mean, I am have plenty of stuff I need to be doing. A lot of times golf is a wonderful way to procrastinate writing a paper. So I don't really have that option anymore, which is maybe a good thing for me. I've been getting things done a lot earlier than normal. So, you know, there's trade-offs. <laughs> for sure. Well, let's dive into this. Last week, we had the privilege of publishing a piece that you wrote that was about your decision to not turn professional, which I, I, I know had been weighing on you. I, I can't imagine how much it's it's been weighing on you. Absolutely, if for anybody listening that has not seen that piece, I, I'd encourage you to check it out. It's it's at nolayingup.com. Rachel, what, what let, let's start here, if you don't mind me asking, what, what were the emotions like for you writing that piece? I, I have to imagine it was both nostalgic, I'm sure very difficult, but but also probably pretty liberating, I would think. Yeah, I mean, all of those things. I I felt really strongly that I wanted to get this out there in my own words. I feel like I had a story to tell. And yeah, I wanted it to be from me. I wanted it to be vulnerable coming from the heart. Uh, I was pretty excited to write it once I really finally made my decision. I think I sat down one day and wrote it all in a few hours. And, you know, I um, cried a bit writing it. I definitely just deciding what to put in there, what to not is hard. I think I could have written 20 pages just about everything golf has, golf has done for me and all my experiences, but it was kind of cathartic to write it. It was nice to just get it all out there and to have it published like it's done now. I feel like it's kind of been a weight off my chest. I feel like the last year or so, just been giving cryptic answers as I try to figure out what I want. You know, everyone's asked me what my plan is when I don't even know what my plan is. So it feels great to just have it all out there. Was there a moment you, you talked about your plan, but was there a moment when you're like, okay, Rachel, like you need to figure this out now. Like we we've kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit. Like when was that for you? Yeah, no, definitely. I'd say late last fall was when I was like, you know what? It's, it's time because life is getting real now. It's easy to be like, Oh, I'll figure that out later. But like, I'm a senior. If I was going to play professional golf, I kind of need a, a job. Like, um, so it's scary. I'm becoming a, a real adult, which is terrifying. But last fall, I was like, all right, this is time. And um, it wasn't, you know, I'd been deliberating on it for a couple years. And, you know, when it came time to decide, like, I knew I knew what I wanted. I'm going to ask you a, a hard question. And <laughs> it's it's not to put you in a bad spot at all. But I know that like day one of your senior year as an ROTC cadet, it's a big deal because you're you're committing and that's it's a, a huge spot for you and when you had surgery the beginning of last year and it really took you out for for the spring semester and obviously you would have played in anwa last year and, and everything else is your rehab weighed into your decision to forgo playing professionally for now and just sticking to you know the path that you've chosen it really wasn't a factor which is so nice i told all my friends and my coaches and my family like I feel so grateful that I came to this on my own before I feel like I had something taken away from me. 
Yeah. Uh, Cause yeah, I don't know if I would have been able to travel like right now with how I am. Like I definitely couldn't go on tour right now. I don't know. I feel just so blessed. Like this is something that I wanted injuries aside. I could be in perfect health and this is still exactly what I would have wanted. So I, I feel super grateful about that. And you know, the, the injuries kind of confirm it a little bit like, all right, well, maybe I don't have that much of a choice anyway, but um, you know, it definitely was a choice that I made for myself before injuries and everything else. I mentioned before, this will be your third time competing at ANWA. I, I double clutched there. I almost Good said job. ANWA. Good I, know, job. I know. I had to think about it. Uh, your, your your first event was 2021. You finished tied for third. You were back in 2022, tied for 27th. Missed last year, but back this year. If, if I may, Rachel, is ANWA something that you hope to continue playing into the future have you thought that far ahead yet with you remaining an amateur gosh just as a fan of 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 golf i i would hope this could be something assuming your body and, and game is up to it that that you could come back oh yeah i mean absolutely that would be the the dream right there if i could play anwa um again in the future obviously it's very hard to get in an anwa i don't know what a I'm sneaky no question by big here i i see I where you're going with this i i, I don't know randy <laughs> well, I, why, why wouldn't they listen if the tournament committee is listening why would they not continue to ex, you know extend invitations to you rachel yes yeah sense? i'll even go uh where, where randy's trying to lead you to what does amateur <laughs> golf look like for you are we still going to play competitively like are we are we trying to play in women's amateur every year we're going to wait and tee it up in women's mid-ams like what does that look like yeah i mean ideally all of it ideally women's am when it comes time for mid-am, um, I'll definitely be playing that. If I'm playing well and get into ANWA, definitely I'll be playing that. U.S. Open qualifiers. So if it were up to me, I'd play all these things. Of course, I don't know what you know my my adult job is going to look like. Hopefully, I get a little bit of flexibility. And they're they're supportive of that. But you know, I definitely don't want to just leave the golf world behind. Like it's still something I just love so much, and I think. I think it'll make competing even more special when it's not something I do every week, when it's something like I genuinely just get to look forward to. I feel like it's easy to take it for granted when that's – even college golf, it almost kind of feels like your job, you're um, traveling a bunch, you're tired, you're playing. You you take a lot of stuff for granted. But when, uh, you know, that's that's the marked on my calendar, something I'm looking forward to, uh, I think it'll be cool. What's your favorite part of this week? Could be on course or off course. I think the – after the first couple of days, everything just gets really fun. You know, um, the first couple of days are probably the most intense days in women's amateur golf. There's just something in the air. Like, everyone wants to make the cut. It's it's kind of brutal, honestly. That course is tough. But after that, it's just, I mean, it's incredible. Like, make or miss the cut. Everyone has such a wonderful time. We get to have these really nice dinners at Augusta. Um, everyone gets to play the, the practice round and, after that, the vibe just takes a full 180, and it's like, okay, this is really cool. You get a little more perspective on it after those two days at Champs Retreat. How much uh, – you said, obviously, you've not been able to play a lot of golf. I, I imagine then that you're going to rely on your, your history at this event, your history both at Champions Retreat and Augusta National. How, how difficult is it to prepare for two different courses? Maybe I maybe I should factor that in more to my practice routine than I do. But for me, I'm just like, okay, one one challenge at a time. Like if I get to play Augusta, life is good. Like I'll figure that out later. Oh, that's a that's a later problem. Those caddies know what they're doing, but I'm more focused on champions retreat going into it. Same with I feel like most of my teammates, like we talk about champions retreat for months. It's it's a hard course. We're like, oh, oh boy, we gotta get through those two days and then you know, the rest will figure itself out. The, the first couple of years, we did not get to see any golf from Champions Retreat. Uh, starting last year, they, they began televising some over there. For folks that, and, and myself included, for folks that aren't as familiar with the Champions Retreat course, what makes it so difficult? They um, play it really long for us. The greens are typically extremely firm. Um, we're coming on with long irons, so super firm greens. There's a whole lot of trouble Usually the weather's really bad, like rounds get delayed, um, which I feel like they probably do on purpose somehow. Um, <laughs> it's just like, um, you know, it's just an extreme, it's absolutely beautiful. It's an incredible course, but we all, 
agree. I'd say like most most of us agree that it's probably the most difficult course we play in amateur golf. Wow. Cody, I had no idea. No, I, I wasn't expecting her to say that. One uh, lasting memory that I have from Champions Retreat is you always have those boats that just randomly show up on the golf course. <laughs> and it'll be like some guy just fishing on like, you know, whatever freak inlets off 12 fairway. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Especially if I'm like struggling. I always get so jealous of those people. <laughs> <laughs> Seem like they're like, man. I'm out here playing in this awesome tournament well, here, but that guy's got a better life than me right he's now. He's on a jet ski right now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, I have to imagine after, like you said, after the two days at Champions Retreat, it, it's so much fun to go over. You get to play a practice round at Augusta National. And then, of course, for those that make the cut, they, the, the final round is at Augusta National. What, Rachel, what are, like, when you close your eyes and, and picture – you know, maybe the most famous golf course in the world. What are some of your favorite shots to hit at Augusta National? Like, like what shots have you missed being able to hit uh, after missing last year's event? 15 for me is a really fun one. Um, just being able to, to go for it. It's usually exciting. It's at the end, a few more holes left. And um, I mean, obviously every hole is iconic, but once you hit like 11, 12, it just becomes surreal. Like there's no way I'm out here right now. Like I've watched this on TV since I was a kid with my dad and like now now we're doing this and I'm competing and there's so many people like it it, it become it changes like it's not something you get with every tournament yeah how, how much have you guys because Stanford I mean god Stanford I feel like is sending the the entire athletic <laughs> department uh so many people Randy this is the fifth year of the Anwa 31 Stanford players I can't believe it incredible yeah, he did say Anwa. Come on, Cody. We established Anwa. Anwa. Yes, Cody. There we go. Rachel, how much have you guys been talking about this event amongst your team? Have you been able to offer much advice to, to some of the younger teammates? We don't talk about golf a whole lot. Um, <laughs> we're all going to be excited. I respect that. I respect that. Honestly, yeah. I would say, like, none of our conversations are about golf. We're all definitely excited. Like, we all got together and took pictures with our invitations, and we're super pumped, like, um, know our freshman Paula to uh, for have her play like we're super excited we all know that but uh I can't I can't lie and say we discuss our like strategy at Champs Retreat every night <laughs> I should know that I mean I spent a week with you guys I, I should know you're yeah, not what? talking much golf off, off off the course yeah you've seen it you know more than anyone <laughs> yeah yeah Randy thought that, that coach Walker and uh secretary Rice were just in there giving you guys motivational speeches and being like all right this is our course we got to take this down come on well let me ask you the flip question to the one I just asked you not your favorite shots at Augusta National but but which shots are are kind of in the back of your mind of like oh god I'm gonna have to deal with this shot or that shot are, are there any the that keep you tee. up at night the first tee yeah <laughs> The first tee, I, I can't hit that fairway. I mean, if I get to hit the first tee shot in a competitive sense, then, like, you know, I won't complain. But it's, oh, my gosh, the nerves there. Like, we've all teed it up in a lot of big events. Um, you know, we've all teed it up in majors. But, like, something's just different about the first tee at Augusta. There's there's people there. Dr. Rice is, like, right behind me. I'm like, oh, gosh, like, I can't let her down. <laughs> um, I don't know what to hit off the tee. Yeah, that's that's one. Like once you get going, then it's it's not too bad. I'm trying to think if there's any. There's not a whole lot after that that's you know in particularly too terrifying. Uh, I hit it in the water on 12 last time. I feel like that yeah, that could haunt me a little bit. I was gonna say everybody talks about 12, trying to figure out the yeah. wind. I know it's a tough yardage there, but. Right. Yeah, I feel like 12 would be the the next one. Um, yeah, twelve. But yeah, just getting out that first tee stuff. I could see that. I could see that. Uh, what what kind of expectations are you allowing yourself this year, or are you just kind of going in with with no expectations? Yeah, I'm definitely trying not to have any expectations. Like there have been times I've come back from injuries, and it's like, wow, it's very clear that I haven't played golf in a while. And then there's sometimes like women's am where I'll. I play great. So, um, you know, I prepare the same way every time. <laughs> Golf is a weird game. So I'm just kind of doing what I'm able to do right now. And we'll see which which one of those happens. Who's going to be caddying for you, if anybody? My dad. Your dad. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Of course, my dad. It's, we've had a 
you know, he's been caddy since I was a little baby, as you, you know, y'all saw in those pictures. So it's pretty, pretty special to have him on the bag. There won't be too many more times. I mean, I'm sure he'll caddy for me in all my mediums, but things like this are winding down. Post Anwa, Anwa, I did it again. Hand up. You guys are gearing up for another incredible, you know, postseason run here to, to nationals. I mean, you get you guys got to be excited as a team. Everybody seems to be rounded into really good form. Uh, I'm sure Coach Walker's doing everything possible to keep you guys f refreshed, as fresh <laughs> as you possibly can. But you got to be excited about that. Got to be excited about graduation. And then what do you think your summer's going to look like? Yeah, first of all, like going to postseason, I mean, we're, we're so pumped. We're excited. Yeah, everyone's playing well. Everyone's yeah, super motivated. Uh, new course, about, yeah, new course. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it, um, but I'm trying to get a little more information so we know how to know how to prep going into it. That's yeah, Coach Walker's great about that. A little better than I am on the preparation side, but yeah, everyone's really excited. I've been getting just so incredibly nostalgic lately. Like, how am I a senior? How do I only have ten more weeks left of this? Like, I feel like I was just a freshman and now it's almost over. So. I've been definitely, you know, taking some time to look around, smell the roses. Uh, and, <laughs> um, it's crazy that it's happening. But um, summer-wise, honestly, I don't really know. I'm hoping – so I'm doing a 10-week internship this spring before I graduate. Hopefully I'll have a little bit of time off before I start back working again. But I would, you know, I would travel, play golf, hopefully be able to play things like women's am, um, you know, maybe just, just some normal – post-graduation things like going on a trip we'll see kind of hard to schedule a lot of unknown but right that's what i was gonna say like is, is there any uh, is there a break anywhere in here i mean hopefully fingers crossed there's a break my sister's getting married like there's a lot of fun things oh uh, cool congrats and then really i guess the big question is when are you going to commission and and start the you know your new life as a reserve officer as well like we're talking about what your normal civilian job is going to be but that's only one part of it Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so I'll commission June 15th. So the day before graduation. And then yeah, from there, I'll figure out at some point, I'll go to um, a couple months of specialized school for my job in the Air Force. And I'll begin that journey. Not exactly sure where I'm going to be. I'm trying to be stationed. Um, like there's an Air Force base an hour and a half from here. I'll be in the Bay Area next week. So that would be ideal. So a lot of things I'm trying to figure out right now. But I mean, ROTC also, I'm getting so nostalgic. Like, everyone's been making fun of me a little bit because I'm, like, taking pictures, and we're, like, they're, like, <laughs> stop. Like, no one's having that much fun right now. But I'm, like, guys, it's almost over. Like, we were just little baby cadets, and now we're commissioning. So, um, yeah, I mean, a bunch of guys, are not, they're not too nostalgic. They can't wait to leave, but I am going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. Well, congratulations on that at uh... – you know, probably the next time we talk to you, you'll no longer be, you know, cadet heck. It'll be lieutenant heck. And then I'm going to make Randy salute you every time he sees you. But it is a really big, a really big accomplishment. And I'm super proud of you for sticking to it because there's been multiple times where you could have been like, yeah, this was cool. Like, I, I experienced this, but, you know, I don't really have to do this. And that's the complete opposite of what you decided to do. And I think it, it it's such you know, a, a tremendous honor for you, but like everybody else. And I know this is going to sound super cheesy to people who aren't military people or around military people, but you joining the air force and sticking to it is a big deal. And you're in, you know, inspiring. And hopefully there, there's a ton of other, you know, men and women that are out there that are like, you know what, if Rachel could do this and still be, you know, one of the best college athletes, one of the best athletes at her you know, chosen craft, then I can do it too. And that's exactly what the military means. And that that's coming from a guy who probably uh, spent way too much, a lot longer than I thought I was gonna in the army. Uh, but looking back now, it was, it was all worth it. Somehow I ended up here on this podcast with you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Well, perfect. Rachel, best of luck this week. Truly. Thank you for the time today. I, I cannot I, I just want to say it, it is so impressive how wise and uh, able to see the bigger picture of life and, and beyond just the game of golf. And I know that's a credit to, to your family, your father, who, who you mentioned specifically in your piece. And 
I just, yeah, I, I'm like, gosh, way more mature than I ever was at your age. So, so I commend you for that and, uh, best of luck, not only at ANWA, but everything going forward this summer and in, into your future. Thanks so much guys. Thanks for having me. Of course.